Well, this is happening. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I've wanted to build a large scale live steam locomotive of the sort that can pull a few adults around on an outdoor track for many, many years. I've slowly been building skills and experience that I hope would prepare me for this kind of project, and I feel like I'm finally at a place where I think I can do it. Now, these projects are very, very large. People often spend a decade building one of these things, and I don't know how long it's going to take me, but if you're asking, to quote Leo over at Samson Boat Company, the answer will always be two years every day that you ask, until one day it ships two years early. Hey, Editor Quinn interrupting here. Just to be clear, this project is not going to be every video on my channel for a long time. I'm only going to be checking in on this project occasionally. I know not all of you are here for the STEAM stuff, so rest assured I'll still be doing the same amount of tool making and educational content and other types of things here on the channel. We've got some prep work and some thinking to do before we can get really going on this thing, but I promise you we will make first chips on this project by the end of this video, so let's go. When you've decided to build your first locomotive, there are lots and lots of options out there. There are a lot of drawings that you can buy, there's lots of free drawings, and there's lots of books about building locomotives. Of course, Kozo Hiraoka is kind of the legend in model engineering for locomotive building books. He's done a lot of them. I have a few examples here, including his Shea and Heisler. Kozo and I share a love of logging locomotives, so that works out well. Another less common example is the Cliché, so named because it's kind of a tribute to both the Climax and the Shea logging locomotives. Now, ironically, it's not a cliché to build the Cliché because it's actually really uncommon, this design. However, I think it's actually a really good choice for beginners. The killer feature of this locomotive is that it has a vertical boiler. And a vertical boiler, much like a donkey engine or a stationary engine would have, is much, much easier to build. And the boiler is the most difficult part for a beginner of any locomotive. So the cliché is basically a donkey engine with logging locomotive running gear under it, which also makes for very simple valve gear. So it's really a nicely simplified design all around. However, as you have already deduced, I have decided to build the Pennsylvania A3 switcher. Now, Kozo specifically wrote this book to be a beginner project. Now, I interpret that to mean beginning locomotive project. I would not recommend anyone try to build a locomotive as your very first machining project. I think you really want some experience machining in general, of course, at least a couple of years of hobby machine shop work. And I think you also want some steam experience. So build a couple of casting kits of stationary engines first, that sort of thing, because you really want to get the feel of the kinds of tolerances that steam engines want, and you definitely want some boiler building experience first. An obvious first question you may have is, how big is this thing? Well, here's a standard metric Japanese man for scale. This is the locomotive built at three and a half inch gauge, which is the size I'm going to build. And that is the first big decision you have to make when building a locomotive is, how big do you want to make it? Typically for live steam, there's three main gauges. There's three and a half inch, five inch, and seven and a quarter, also called seven and a half. They're basically compatible. But gauge and scale, while related, are different things. As you might deduce if you've ever looked at the Wikipedia page for model railroading scales and gauges, it's a little bewildering. Gauge refers to the distance between the rails, but scale refers to how big all the parts are relative to the real thing. So you might be building an HO gauge model railroad, which specifies the size of the track, but the scale is 187. And those are not always matched up that way. For example, you might be using HO gauge track to build a double O scale narrow gauge logging locomotive. Fortunately for live steam, the situation is a fair bit simpler. Really, we're just talking about three and a half inch gauge, five inch gauge, and seven and a quarter inch gauge, which maps to 1 16th, 1 11th, and 1 8th scale. In my case, we're talking three and a half inch gauge, which is also often called three quarter inch scale, which means the model is three quarters of an inch to the foot on the real thing. Or said another way, the final model will be 1 16th the size of the real locomotive. So why did I choose three and a half inch gauge? Well, first and foremost, the only club within driving distance that has a track where I could run this locomotive only has three and a half inch and seven and a half inch gauge tracks. So it would have to be one of those. My yard isn't big enough to build my own track. And of course, the drawings in the book are for three and a half inch gauge, which makes life easier. Although Kozo does supply instructions for scaling it up to seven and a quarter, if that's something you want to do. 
but seven and a quarter inch gauge is also kind of a major lifestyle choice. Like you can't just put this thing in your car and take it to the club anymore. You have to have a trailer and hydraulic lifts and things to manipulate a locomotive that big. It's basically like owning a motorcycle or a sports car at that point. You're pretty committed to this thing. Whereas three and a half inch gauge, eh, you can put it in a box. I've chosen the A3 Switcher book because it is specifically written for a beginning locomotive builder so that the structure of the book is really excellent and it also happens to be a really beautiful locomotive. It's perfectly proportioned and it's just the kind of locomotive that I'd want to build anyway. Now Kozo's is liveried in Pennsylvania, which is perfectly reasonable because the design of this locomotive is the Pennsylvania A3. However, my loyalties lie with Canadian Pacific, so mine will be Canadian Pacific livery. Now this is cheating a little bit because CPR never actually ran this exact 040 switcher, but they did run an 060, which is extremely similar. So I'm going to cheat a little and build the 040, which is extremely similar right down to the handrails and the work light on the tender. So I think I can get away with building this 040 and, and hypothetically maybe the CPR ran one of these at some point. And it's got to be CPR because there's just nothing like Canadian Rocky Mountain Railroading. This is the line that built the spiral tunnels through Kicking Horse Pass, wherein the train crosses over itself twice to make an unprecedented elevation change. They also built the Stony Creek Arch Bridge, which is an absolute wonder of engineering. So it's really an incredible line built through incredibly difficult conditions. And every mile of it is just a masterpiece of engineering. So CPR it is for me. The next important decision is metric or imperial. Generally, I would say follow whatever the drawings you have are for your locomotive, because a locomotive is so complex with thousands of tolerances that all have to interact just right. If you start trying to change the units on things, you're really asking for trouble. This job is tough enough without doing that to yourself. Now, Kozo has done locomotives in both. His newer books tend to be metric, and his older ones are imperial. The A3 switcher is imperial, so that is what I'm going to be using. Yay! The clever thing about Kozo's A3 book is that it's really structured for the beginner. So he starts you off by building the tender because the operations there are much simpler and he kind of eases you into all the different processes and skills that you'll need when you get to the more complex parts on the engine. So you get to learn silver soldering and turning wheels and making axles and doing some sheet metal work and riveting and all these types of things on the tender, which is both simpler and if you screw it up, it's a little less crucial than when you get to the locomotive where everything has to be a little bit more perfect. And pause for sprocket. Okay. And I'm, I need to, can you just, thank you. That said, I am not going to start at the beginning. I am actually going to start with the boiler. That might sound like madness, and if you haven't built a lot of steam engines, then it is madness. However, the reason that I'm going to do this is because the boiler is by far the most difficult part of the engine, and it's the showstopper. The boiler is all or nothing. You have to build this incredibly complex and difficult thing, and either it works and your locomotive will work, or it won't and your locomotive is a boat anchor. Nothing else on this build really concerns me. It's just a lot of machining and sheet metal work that I've done plenty of, and I may not make it perfectly, but I know I can do it. However, the boiler, if I don't get this right, then the rest of the project is a wash, and I don't want to spend years and years making this locomotive and then get to the boiler and not be able to do it. A project this complex really needs some kind of production plan. So what I've decided to do is work on the book in sections. And for each section, I'm going to photocopy all the pages of the book for that section and put them in a little binder. That way I don't have the beautiful and not inexpensive Kozo book in the shop with me where it's going to get damaged and dirty and so on. And then for each section, I can then sit down and make a materials list for it. Unlike most woodworking projects, if you're using plans that you find online or in books, machining projects generally don't give you a materials list. I guess machinists consider it weakness if you need to be given a materials list, but I don't know, that's just always how it is. So step one for a given section is to go through it, identify all the parts you need to make and what materials you will need to make those parts. Now I have done that here with my little spreadsheet for the boiler. But I would also like to call out a particularly heroic hobby machinist over on the Model Engine Maker Forum who goes by the name of Kim. He has actually gone through this entire book and produced a materials list for the entire engine, which is, like I said, truly heroic. I'll link to his build log below. I think it's the only really complete build log that I've seen for this engine online. It's really, really well done. He's in progress as this is being recorded. So shout out to him. He's been a big inspiration to me. 
once I've got my material list, then I actually have to source all these materials, which for a boiler is not that easy because it's a lot of fairly exotic copper and brass stock. One of the big challenges with this Kozo engine is that while the drawings are all imperial, his materials are clearly metric, obviously because he's in Japan and that's what he can get. So for example, all of the copper sheet is specified as 79 thou thickness for the boiler, but that's not a standard copper sheet metal gauge. Of course, 79 thou is actually two millimeters, so no doubt Kozo designed this boiler around that plate because that's what he can get in Japan. Now luckily, McMaster here in North America does have 80 thou copper sheet, which is very, very close. So that's what I'm gonna end up using. Luckily I was able to get that because there is no sheet metal gauge that's really even close to that. So this metric materials thing is going to bite me a few more times. Even here in Canada, even though it's a metric country, we really don't have a lot of metric materials here. Our materials are mostly still in Imperial. I looked at a lot of places online for all these materials, all of my usual go-tos like eBay and online metals and metal supermarkets. Where I ended up going is really McMaster for everything. McMaster ended up being the cheapest for all this stuff, which is not usually the case, but it was in this case, so that was actually really nice to be able to buy everything in one place. So I've got the copper sheet here for the shell and the firebox and all that sort of thing. I've got some copper round bar here for various things. I've got some flat bar here for the fire door and various tabs and braces and ribs and things. Then I've got some small tubing for the internal steam plumbing. And then of course we have this big tubing here for the fire tubes. The fire tube material was another interesting challenge. The drawings specify 787 thou diameter and 47 thou thick. Again, that's not a tubing size that exists in, in the imperial stock world. So clearly what Koza is using there is 1.2 millimeter wall thickness of 20 millimeter copper tubing. And again, I could not find that anywhere in North America. Uh, trust me, I looked. We do have 20 millimeter tubing in one millimeter wall thickness, but that's too thin. I didn't want to go thinner on anything because of course then you're flirting with safety margins. So what I ended up doing was going a little bit smaller diameter on the tubing. I went to three quarter inch tubing, which is of course 750, and I was able to get this in 65 thou wall thickness. So again, not going thinner to risk flirting with safety margins, but the downside to going thicker on the fire tubes is that they will get less efficient. Really you want fire tubes to be as thin as possible because the thinner they are, the more efficient they are. So by making them thicker, I am losing some efficiency here. However, Kozo himself admits that the fire tubes in this particular boiler design really aren't doing that much anyway for efficiency. They're passing combustion gases, but that's really about all they're doing. So I don't think I'm gonna hurt the boiler's performance by doing this. And by going smaller on the tube size instead of larger, I'm not gonna be interfering with any other features on the boiler. The nice thing about the fire tubes is they don't really interact with anything else in the boiler besides the tube sheets, so making them a few thou smaller isn't going to hurt anything. If you try to start making things bigger on the boiler, then you're going to have changes that cascade through the whole design while you try to adapt all the neighboring parts to your new thing. So again, you really want to avoid messing with the dimensions of anything in a complex structure like this, but that's a little bit hard to avoid when you can't get metric materials. Fortunately, the bronze parts are a lot easier because these are all going to be machined parts and the stock can be eh, whatever is larger than the parts. All of this again came from McMaster. The one part that was tricky was I needed inch and a half round bar for the large steam dome base. But due to weird lingering supply chain issues from COVID, inch and a half bronze round bar right now is basically unobtainium. I found a lot of places that claim to have it, but when I ordered it, they all canceled my order because nobody could actually get it. I ended up ordering this bronze flat bar and I can cut a disc out of this to make that base. One last crucial thing, most of the parts of this boiler are hammer formed, of course, because they are complex sheet metal parts, so you need material for the forms for that hammer forming. So I decided to go with this stuff here. It's a high-tech expanded celluloid product. It's called OAK, I'm not sure what that stands for, but it's lightweight, easy to work with, and it makes excellent hammer forms. It's a little bit expensive. I mean, these high-tech materials don't grow on trees, but I think it's gonna work really well. Previously, you've seen me use aluminum for sheet metal hammer forms and roll forms, but this would take a lot of aluminum and that's gonna get expensive and slower to machine. So I'm gonna go with the traditional OAC product here for this. If you live in a major metro area, you've no doubt got woodworking shops or hardwood suppliers near you where you can go and you know, pull a bunch of stuff out of their offcuts bin for this. I don't have anything like that around here, so I actually went to Home Depot and they have these things they call hobby boards. They come in oak and maple, 
and they're not that expensive. A little more expensive than a hardwood supplier, I'm sure, but they're already planed and jointed, and that's actually going to save me a lot of work for making these forms, so this is actually a pretty good buy, I think. All of the parts on the boiler are silver soldered together, so you're going to need some kind of hearth, and this is my silver soldering setup here. I've got the little hardware store torch for smaller parts, and then for the big stuff, I've got my big Sievert propane torch. This is straight propane, no oxypropane, no oxyacetylene. I've really moved away from mixed gas torches for silver soldering because you just don't need that peak temperature that the expensive mixed gas setups produce. Really what you need is volume of heat. Plain propane is plenty hot enough to melt silver solder, but what you need is the ability to heat up very large structures all at once. And for that, you just really want a plain old propane torch with a big old tip on it. This is my medium sized tip, I think it's inch and a half. I've also got this little tip for finer work. And then towards the end when the structure is large, I've got this giant monster two inch tip, which is actually for roofing. And this tip turns this torch into a fire breathing banshee of death and destruction. It's good fun. The silver solder itself I'm using is Harris Safety Seal 56. This is essentially a cadmium free version of Easy Flow number two, like the Brits use. This is a really great low temperature silver solder. And Kozo's design specifies only one heat range of silver solder. He specifically designed his order of operations so that you don't need multiple heat ranges. So this should be great stuff. I've used a lot of this stuff and I've really had good luck with it. I like it a lot. Then for flux, I'm using the matching Harris Safety Silve Black Flux. Silver solder flux comes in two flavors, white and black. And the black stuff is the same. They've just added boron to it, which extends the heat range of the flux, essentially makes it last longer while you're heating the joint, which is super helpful. It makes it a lot more forgiving because one of the most common failure points of silver soldering is that the flux spoils before you get the joint hot enough to get the silver solder to flow. For silver soldering boilers, you have to use real silver solder. You cannot use, for example, the so-called high silver content plumbing solders. It's not real hard silver solder. It's not sufficient for a steam pressure vessel. You got to use the real thing, and you'll know if it's the real thing because your credit card melts when you buy it. Let me sort of preemptively answer a few questions about silver soldering boilers because every time I do a boiler video, I get a lot of similar questions from folks in like air conditioning or radiator repair, other adjacent disciplines that also use various forms of silver soldering or silver brazing. Well, the first question people always ask is why copper? It seems it's so expensive and it's hard to get. Why don't you just make these boilers out of steel? Larger locomotive boilers are made of steel, but of course steel rusts, so it's a lot higher maintenance and it's a lot more difficult to hammer form and other make the complex structures that a boiler requires. Hobbyists use copper because it's extremely easy to work with for creating these complex shapes out of relatively thick material using simple tools. And when you're done, the result will never rust and it'll last 100 years. Okay, so given that we're using copper, why silver solder? Why don't you, for example, TIG weld? You can TIG weld copper. Well, maybe you can. I cannot. TIG welding is a fairly sophisticated skill and TIG welding exotic metals even more so and you need to be able to create perfect joints that are both gas and pressure tight. And there are many, many skilled welders in the world who can do that on copper. I am absolutely not one of them, and most hobbyists are not nearly at that level. So again, that's why we use silver solder, because it's approachable for the hobbyist, the learning curve is shallow, and just about anybody can do it. Okay, but then why hard silver solder? Why not use brazing rods? For example, copper phosphorus rod, which is used in a lot of, again, similar trades to boiler making. Well, first of all, you can't use anything that has phosphorus in it, which most of these types of brazing rods do. Steam will attack phosphorus and weaken the joints. And some of them have other compounds in them like sulfur, which are not compatible with the combustion products of a coal fire. So those joints will be weakened by the combustion in the boiler, even if they're okay for steam. All of these kind of modern brazing products are designed for either non-steam environments like air conditioning or for modern steam environments where there isn't generally a coal fire involved. So again, silver solder is the safe bet here. Some of these brazing alloys are okay. For example, there's one called SIF bronze, which is generally considered safe for coal-fired steam boilers. However, the melting point of that material is extremely high. So you basically have to use oxyacetylene to braze with that stuff. And again, while it certainly can be done, and if you're a skilled gas welder, go ahead and use that stuff, you'll do great. However, for most hobbyists, it's just way easier to use a propane torch and basic silver solder. 
So I hope that answers some of the questions that I always get about why model engineers have been making boilers this way for 100 years and continue to do so, because it just really is a great solution to all of the challenges that are unique to steam at this scale. Enough yammering, let's make something, or start to start to start to make something. The first thing I'm going to need are the hammer forms for all of the boiler components. So I've laid those out on my piece of oak here. It took me a few tries to get things laid out efficiently, and I couldn't find my eraser, but trust me, that mess of chicken scratches makes sense to me. My miter saw made quick work of cutting off the end there that I'm working with. This is an 8-foot board, so I don't want to be manipulating this over on the bandsaw where I'm going to be doing the finer cuts. I could do more cuts with the miter saw here, but the kerf is a little bit thick on it. don't want to get myself in trouble with making any of these pieces too small. I wasn't sure if this bandsaw was going to be suited to this, because I've never tried cutting wood on it, but it is a fairly coarse blade. I've got it set up for mostly aluminum and fairly thick stock, and it made very, very short work of this oak. It complained a little bit on rip cuts, but on cross cuts it was a beast, so no trouble there. So I've got the backing plate forms here, and then I've got the throat former and the throat side former, and then I've got the front tube sheet formers here, and then finally the backhead formers. Most of these are in pairs, a former and a backer, and then the throat sheet has two separate formers and no backers. And then just a little piece of waste left over, so I was pretty happy with that. Well, obviously lots more work to do on those formers, but that is all the time I have for you this week. I promised you first chips. I didn't say they'd be metal. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible. Stay tuned for more videos in this series as I make progress on the engine, and I will see you next time.